Um, hello, everybody, and I'm very glad to see you all uh, joining uh, this year's uh, GIS uh, themed roundtable. The more granular the data, the more useful. Um, in this uh, roundtable, we are having uh, five participants from uh, different organizations uh, sharing their view on this uh, topic, especially for those uh, dealing with uh, GIS and data related topics. You may fr frequently come uh, with uh, this uh, issue that uh, somebody may request you um, um, say a dashboard or a map and they would like to go as much detail as possible but uh, how about the ethical side of this is this uh, really considerate uh, considering the the the, the rights uh, the the well-being of the very target communities this is a question that has pretty much always been around the humanitarian circles but especially now with the COVID with the request for very granular data, this topic might be uh, more, mm, more urgent to talk about than ever before. And uh, we look forward to having an interesting discussion from uh, many different viewpoints uh, during this uh, roundtable session. And um, I would like to first, I, it, I am, my name is Elsa Raunio. I am the uh, GIS uh, project manager at Carto NG, and uh, I will be the co-facilitator for this session together with my colleague, um, Sylvie de la Borderie. Would you like to present yourself, Sylvie, quickly? Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. I'm Sylvie de la Borderie, GIS project manager at Carto NG. Thank you very much, Sylvie. And now shall we go to the actual presenters in the order in which they will be speaking. And we start with uh, Wendy Peterson from the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining. Hi, hello everybody. I'm just gonna share my presentation, one second. I think we will do a quick presentation oh, okay. round and after. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, okay, got yeah, it. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm Wendy no Peterson from the Geneva Center. So we work in Mine Action, which is the removal of explosive ordnance left for more. And I am the GIS Solutions Advisor for the Information Management Division. And, uh, and next, our next presenter is uh, Jean Guy Odeo. Normally press, uh, working at the Carto NG team, but under the MSF GIS unit. Hi there, nice to meet you all. I am uh, Jean Guy, and uh, I'll be speaking on uh, behalf of uh, MSF today and the GIS unit of MSF. Many thanks, uh, Jean Guy. And the next presenter, Professor Bernd Resch. Hi everybody, my name is Bernd Resch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Salzburg here and a visiting scholar at Harvard University. Um, I'm doing work on geosocial analytics, so I'm analyzing a variety of uh, human generated data sources to better understand geographic social processes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bernd. And the next one will be uh, Jan Rebois. Uh Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Yann Rebois, and I'm working as the head of Geodata and Analytics teams for the International Committee of the Red Cross. And, uh, and the last but not least, uh, Yvonne Oran. Bonjour à tous. Uh, Est-ce que vous m'entendez bien? Can you hear me well? Yes. Good because I had a little problem just a few seconds ago. So my name is Yvon Oran. I'm working in UNHCR, I'm branded here, and uh, I'm just a, a GIS expert working in the global data system teams in UNHCR Geneva. And I've been doing so for the past 20 years. That's the last thing I can say. <laughs> Over. Thank you very much, uh, our great uh, panelists. And now I would like to give the floor to Wendy Pedersen. Thank you. Alrighty. So just give me one second.
So I think you all can see the slideshow. There we go. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of briefly go through how we deal with data sensitivity in Mind Action. Um, and to begin with, uh, again, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Mind Action, uh, we deal with uh, the clearance and removal of explosive remnants of war. So that entails, of course, removing the devices themselves, but also providing a risk education to communities to prevent accidents from happening. And also within the sector, there are aspects of victim assistance. So those who have uh, had an accident with the destination of a device left over, that they have received the services that they need. But of course, to do these kinds of things, we need, there needs to be effective decision making. And of course, that is driven by the data in mine action. And fortunately, everything that is collected information-wise in mine action is also inherently geographic. Whether it's the terrain or the location of the suspected hazardous area or confirmed hazardous area, the population distribution of those affected and at risk, the location of hospital and infrastructure to care for those who may be at risk or who may have an accident, and of course, the types of vegetation and the general landscape that may affect or influence how clearance is able to occur. All of these, once combined and assessed, determine the, the impact and the risk of, of an, an impact of mines. Now, to be able to determine what kind of information and data we gather, there's a few key questions, and these are just a few that I wanna show you, but a few key questions that are often asked in organizations before they begin operations. So within the variety of roles within mine action, we have to see as an actor or the specific role, uh, what is it you need to do? And as that person, what do you need to know in order to do whatever it is you need to do to, in order to provide a certain service? So if I were to give an example here for say, uh, mine risk education, say the actor is an educator and for them, they need to know the type of contamination, type of explosive devices that a community is in close proximity to and may come across. Once they have that, they'll be able to provide and create specific types of training courses that are relevant for this community and what they may come across. And in, in the end, they can provide actual viable, really important training that really, really can help community protect themselves and be self-aware of their environment. And that's determining how we collect certain aspects of da data and what needs to be collected. But in addition, when it comes to the visualization of the data, additional questions are often have it to be asked. And these are kind of typical, again, just some of the key ones that would typically be asked. So as a certain person in a role, what are the five key things or questions that you would like to know or have answered by the information management team or the operator or the educator or whoever is getting data from the mine action uh, sector. And then once we have those questions uh, or we have the information, the information management team that hosts the national database of all the data that's collected from all operators doing clearance or uh, victim assistance or mine risk education, they need to see what are the minimum required data that's required to provide that needed information. If they need to know what is the type of contamination, maybe they also need to know the depth and the depth of clearance that has been done. So if uh, a contaminated area has been cleared up to two meters in depth, we also know there's certain other types of contamination that may exist at deeper depths. That's some information that somebody may need to know for developmental purposes. If they're going to build buildings or new infrastructure, they need to know what they may come across. And of course, and, this, and once we know the data that's required, we need to know what aspects of that data may be sensitive. So for example, with victim assistance, um, for those providing a victim assistance, resources to people who have had injuries as a result of an explosion of a mine or a bomb or something like that, um, there are very personal and private levels of information that is accessible to the people providing these needs and services. However, for example, for donors who need reporting and to know how many people have received benefits, um, they don't need to know the names of the victims. They don't need to know the home addresses or the personal information of those people. So again, we need to know the level of information sensitivity associated with the different aspects of data that's being collected for each topic. Now, one example of how we do these visualizations is a new approach uh, called the Global Awareness of Mine Action or GAMMA for short. 
And this is a new developing initiative within the mine action community as we're becoming more and more uh, adept in using uh, Azure tools such as Portal or Arc, you know, Arc Enterprise or Arceus Online. A lot of pod more operators are using the services. So we're having more ability to provide uh, much more in-depth uh, visualizations. But of course, that is touching more and more into that data sensitivity you mentioned before. So with global awareness of mine action, we're trying to provide online interactive dashboards that have a way for people to dive into the data, dive into the infographics and take more ownership of the information they're digesting. We find that information sticks much better this way as opposed to the static map or chart or, or statistics. And of course, these variety of different kinds of dashboards have certain types of breakdowns depending on the specific user and what they are privy to and what level of data sensitivity they have access to. Here's an example of a dashboard. Um, you can see that we have a variety of different information breakdowns. Each chart is according to what the user end user needs. And the map in the middle is starts out as a generic heat map showing the level of either contamination or clearance that has been accomplished within each province. Once they dive further into the into the data set, it goes, the breakdown moves down to district and then commune. And then as they go down even further, they'll see uh, the actual information that they need, such as uh, where certain um, clearance operations are happening, where education has taken place, and so on and so forth. And as they zoom in further, they may even have access to be able to see where the exact areas of, of contamination is and the exact areas of accidents have occurred. Again, this depends on the type of user and what they have access to. And of course, what the national authority who owns the, the data um, is agreeing that these individuals can and cannot have access to themselves. So it's a collaboration, a community collaboration between the mine action sector itself and of course the national authority who holds their ownership of the data. There's another way that we have um, shown very sensitive data and that was with an educational campaign that we have at the center, which is on anti-vehicle mine awareness. So anti-vehicle mines are still a very huge issue. There isn't quite a lot of um, uh, things in place to prevent the use of these. So to kind of show the impact of these mines, there's an interactive map here that shows where accidents have happened, a general heat map showing which countries are most effective. And of course, you'll be able to actually click on those individual accidents and get a variety of information, such as a description, uh, the date of the incident, the number of casualties, and in some cases, a photograph of the accident itself. Nothing gruesome, but typically just showing the aftermath of the vehicle that, that, that was exploded. Now, in this case, the data that was gathered, uh, there's a certain level of confidence that was not achieved. So in some cases, you know, actually a lot of this data is pulled from a variety of sources and not all of the sources are able to show that we have a confident a marker on whether accident took place. They may have said that the accident took place in just the town. And so they're using the centroid of that town as the location. And other situations, the location of the accident is very, very sensitive. As a result, the level in which the, the, the user can zoom into the map itself and look at the data is limited. So if they continue to zoom into the map, after a certain point, all the data disappears and they just see a basic uh, base map showing you know, roads and administrative lines, but there is no information on the accidents themselves. Now to kind of help give the user a little bit more, we have of course the statistical breakdowns and there is also in, in some cases, static maps that we also produce in addition to a publication that is, is companion piece to this. That actually shows maybe a bit more breakdowns in other ways. But again, we will never show the actual, um, spot of where that accident happened, we will only show the general location. And again, for sensitive, re sensitive reasons on where the data is, but also due to the level of confidence we have on the accuracy of the data itself. And that's pretty much all I have on that. So these are just a few examples of some, some ways that we've approached the problem and the issue. And yeah, I look forward to discussing with you all further on this. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation on a, on a topic which is uh, very, very relevant for the thematics of this roundtable. And everybody, feel free to uh, write uh, your, your questions uh, to Wendy, and we will then proceed uh, to the questions after all the speakers have, have 
given their presentation. And the next, I would like to give the table to Jean-Guy Odeot, Carto uh, NG, MSF. Hello all. Um, so I'll be um, approaching today the uh, the um, roundtable by uh, abording it from a slightly different angle. The idea of this presentation will be to provide a little bit of a deeper dive on a practical case that happened in a few MSF missions uh, where we basically had a way had to find a way to um, to balance between the capacity of uh, performing advanced uh, spatial analysis and quite detailed without uh, jeopardizing, jeopardizing patient confidentiality. Uh, two things uh, that I would like to mention as an introduction. Um, one, this uh, work uh, done in collaboration between Carto NG and the GIS unit is about an internal tool at uh, MSF. We felt that was a relevant example because sometimes we feel that internal tools, simply due to the fact they are internal to the organizations, uh, can be sometimes a little bit of a weak point when it comes to data protection practices because it was feel safe by the simple way, uh, the simple reason that it is internal. And second, uh, during the presentation, we will also try to keep in mind that behind the tools in the visualization, there are workflows where the data actually transits from the place it's collected to the place that it's analyzed and from that place then to the eyes of the people who will try to, to, um, to use it for decisions. And always keeping in mind that not only the application or the visualizations themselves must be um, seen through data protection practices, but also the workflow behind them. So very quickly, a bit of context. We have an MSF mission working in an infectious disease context, HIV and DRTB. Uh, drug resistant tuberculosis, focusing uh, the mission on testing and patient monitoring as well as testing alternative care models with the local authorities. The mission has been in that precedent uh, situation, implementing mobile data collection and some basic GIS visualizations for patient follow-up and hotspot analysis. And then the GIS unit, which is basically us in that case, or anybody who will be in our shoes, is called in to support and refine the analysis, bring the GIS analysis further, and improve data protection practices. So the mission and the tools that are developed are fully compliant with internal and external regulations in MSF and outside the group. So as I mentioned, there is a workflow already before you arrive. It's pretty simple at the beginning. You have a phone collecting uh, data. We will see in a moment which one. We have uh, behind that an internal uh, Kobo server that is used, and then the data is called in and visualized in a geo app or a dashboard uh, that allows visualization and analysis. Uh, we have uh, staff who are trained in secure access and manipulation of data. The tool is already used. Uh, and, um, 600 uh, patients are already followed up. Uh, hotspot are tracked. Uh, the missions and the operational uh, teams on the fields are loading the tool. They want to expand it. They want to move to an upgraded version of the tool. But of course, there are uh, challenges uh, that are being brought up, especially regarding data collection. So what? Uh, what is there when you arrive? Uh, you already have a, a global aggregated analysis in place. Uh, the uh, survey is being analyzed by the totalization of the RTD patients per admin area. You have some global indicators and filtering over your cohort of patients per age, per sex, and per uh, time. And then uh, you also have global aggregated statistics and some criteria and indicators of uh, your cohort of patients. In addition to that, you also have a disaggregated, disaggregated anonymized analysis, which means you are able to access anonymized information about patients one by one. For example, the number of visits and the number of times your patient comes to see uh, your health facility. And you also have information individual to each patient categorized, such as distance to the nearest health facility. Now, we do need to balance two things here. Needs to provide. Uh, to, to, to deliver basically solution to the mission and at the same time guaranteeing data protection practices. So when aggregated data is not granular enough for efficient decision making, the mission complains, uh, the zones are too big, they are not able to cover the gaps if they identify some because the granularity is too, too big. Then uh, they also require individual uh, special analysis, which is quite detailed. They accept categorizations and uh, to aggregation to some extent, but uh, they want to identify cover gaps in patient cohorts when they are in need of a medical follow-up. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, MSF Health Data Protection Policy, as well as additional external regulations, GDPR and local, must be respected. 
So uh, the adaptations of the GIS analysis that were uh, in place were the following. First, we went to uh, admin boundaries uh, aggregation to grid-based. So how was that done? Um, the grid was defined over the area of analysis that, that uh, guaranteed a sufficient granularity to be relevant to allow proper analysis, and also guaranteeing the impossibility to identify visually one patient location if you, if you have to consult them one by one. Um, we also had to uh, change the size of the grid, uh, depending on the fact if you are in an urban area, which requires more precise uh, analysis, and um, if you are in a rural area where you might need a bigger grid cells because you might be able to identify one lone house in this area. Uh, one important thing to know, and I will come back to it at the end of the PowerPoint, was that this was manual. It was a manual visual check to answer grid realism, which is why this uh, scenario is for the moment only applicable to that context and not a movement-wide uh, solution at the moment. Then, uh, as a second uh, uh, GIS modification of the, of the system, we also uh, maintain the possibility to consult some, some uh, individualized details about patients, of course, anonymized, uh, to not allow uh, people to, um, to gather information and find information about the patient itself. A retaining possibility to apply this analysis to one patient, but then the location would obviously not be the exact place where uh, the person or the household will live. They would be actually moved to the center of the grid cell node and uh, used as a mean then to access them. Uh, intermediary data is deleted during the phase of analysis, but I will come back to that at the end of the PowerPoint. Just one thing to mention as well, in, in order to ensure a proper um, a treatment of the analysis and a proper separation uh, of the information, the people able to see the GEO app to consult information about the cohorts and the patient able to see individual um, uh, information about the patient, we are not doing it on the same platform, but on a separate platform with different login access. Some other analyses were considered along the way, the possibility, amongst other things, to see uh, it through heat maps. But um, we felt that uh, this would not provide a sufficient uh, level of analysis, especially relevant to the fact that uh, some of the uh, statistics needed to be opposed to population data. And using only heat maps would not allow to link to uh, valid population data over certain areas. So how was the uh, workflow modified? Uh, data was still connected on the phones. Then it was uh, still aggregated on the MSF Kobo server and cleaned if necessary. Then it was uh, pulled out of Kobo and sent out for treatment to the GIS unit. Uh, this required a, a series of uh, imp so regular sequential improvements to make sure that it's sent in a secured way. Then uh, data would be processed, anonymized, aggregated if needed, and intermediary data would be deleted. Then it will be stored on the GIS server and displayed on the new uh, application. As a conclusion, that was a bit fast, but I needed to keep the time. Uh, on the improvement side, MDC collection remained adapted to the mission evolving needs and managed to balance operational needs with data protection approach. Effective progress and critical point was done. And probably the best one of these ones was all the back and forth steps uh, led to the development of data awareness in the mission. However, on the challenges still remaining in the coping solution currently being explored, one, data protection is still a separate step from uh, data processing, which means at the early steps of the workflow, uh, between, uh, between the moment data arrives on the phones and beneath the moment it's aggregated, sensitive data still lingers in the workflow. We are looking at two separate solutions. One is improving and securing collection and transmission, and the other one is integrating the processing of data and its anonymization directly at data collection level, possibly directly on phones, which means uh, sensitive data will not be saved and not have to be secured afterwards for, st for storage or for transmission. Then uh, moving to grid-based analysis made comparison harder with other contextual indicators, population, for example, because we could not use anymore. Um, uh, um, census population, but alternative analyses are possible, for example, using a human um, HRSL data set or world population. Intermediate manual steps for data are still partly manual. We are still looking uh, into automatiz automatization of them through interoperability tools, sorry, uh, through FME, for example. And then lastly, uh, tailor-made process, which is the solution that we designed for the mission, is still designed for one specific context, as I mentioned. Uh, scalability to the entire MSF movement is still uh, to be improved, 
because some steps are really uh, still manual. It's under investigation and sharing at the GIS unit and the Carto NJ. And well, that's uh, one of uh, the reasons of our presence here today. And nine minutes, it's still on time. Um, thank you. That was a bit fast, but don't hesitate to write your questions in the Q&A and uh, we will do our best to answer them in the, in the Q&A session. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Guy, for the, for the practical, uh, very practical examples on how the data anonymization may work in practice. Now, let me give the table to Professor Bernd Resch. Thank you very much. So um, I would like to, to take um, the topic a little bit more towards a specific issue in privacy, which is called location privacy. I don't know whether it's trivial for everybody, but there are different types of privacy. Uh, let's say personal data, including health data and so on is one thing, but then the location itself is another thing. And for us, it obviously matters for all people in here dealing with GS and geospatial data. And uh, what we do in general um, is to analyze, yeah, let's say geosocial media data, but other human generated data to support humanitarian action. This is nothing new to you. I just wanted to show you a few examples of which data we're dealing with. So there are very clear indications, for example, in this case, in a natural disaster, uh, enormous damage along Horse Pen Creek, Houston, Copperfield, Hurricane Harvey. And then all these um, tweets, for example, would have a GPS position attached. So we know very clearly from where they're coming. And then perhaps even images are attached, uh, which is a separate challenge in, in itself. Um, the same applies to even perhaps a bit more of a sensitive um, topic of, let's say, um, refugee analysis and, and analysis of refugee movements. So very clearly, again, people stating what happens um, around. And uh, so for example, three and a half thousand refugees crossed from Hungary into Austria overnight. Um, so where people are moving and, and perhaps even attaching different kinds of media, including images. So just to, to set the scene, which, which kinds of um, data we're dealing with. I would just like to sketch out um, three examples of results for which um, we think obviously this kind of, of um, location privacy is important. So first of all, um, the analysis of an earthquake in this case. So we see a two week uh, period of tweets here. Uh, on the weekends, people tweet a bit less than during the week. And then we see this kind of thing here. So if we zoom into that peak, we see this, that uh, in the middle of the night at 320, uh, an earthquake happened and immediately, so with zero delay, basically, um, the Twitter curve rose and, and gave us an indication of what happened. So that's the temporal point of view. The spatial point of view is this. So this is what our analysis um, results look like. Spatial hotspots, for those of you who know, uh, get this or GI star, standard attribute clustering, basically, in space. So we say the red areas have been affected by the um, by the earthquake, the blue ones. Yes, many people have tweeted there about the earthquake as well, but these areas were not affected. If we overlay this with the um, official earthquake footprint of USGS, we can already see that there is a very high correlation between our hotspots and, and the official data. And the same basically applies to a number of um, different, um, uh, let's say, um, use cases, including refugee movements, in this case, data from um, 2015 to 16. So what you see in the beginning of all this situation is that there is a quite uh, strong cluster in uh, the border region between Turkey, Bulgaria, and Greece. And then things start shifting across um, the, the Balkan, basically. Um, then we see that the Hungarian and Serbian border is very strongly frequented. And then all of a sudden, things shift over to, to Austria and so on as well. Uh, then um, Orban and, and Hungary built their infamous um, um, fence here on the border. So there we see that basically uh, things are shifting more towards the south. So more people were more, more going to Slovenia and entering Austria in the southern border. The idea again is to support humanitarian agencies, uh, including um, MSF, uh, Red Cross, and we're working with a number of, of you guys um, to give you a bit of a better feeling, let's say, of what's happening in more or less real time without too much of a delay. And then the third thing is, um, is epidemiology. So COVID-19 has been one of our major use cases here. Um, here again, the timeline, which uh, is very clearly mappable to a number of events, like declarations by the WHO, 
um, by the CDC and so on. And again, the spatial viewpoint would be this. So um, in this case, again, COVID-19 hotspots very clearly in the northeast of the country, um, the south, um, west and the northwest. Um, and they obviously, um, let's say, vary over time as well. Um, and uh, this is basically our, our general idea that we try to analyze and also predict these um, different kinds of, of, let's say, hotspots over time, which again, not only uh, is of interest to, to um, NGOs and relief organizations, but even more so to public governments and perhaps to, to uh, pharmaceutical companies. So this was in a very brief nutshell, um, what we're doing and, and why I think we need to care about um, privacy at all. And the definition of geo privacy or location privacy, again, maybe known or not, I'm just gonna repeat it quickly. The idea of location privacy and geo privacy is um, the, uh, the protection of, um, of data and um, their disclosure to prevent individuals from being identified through locational information. So this was basically what uh, Jean-Guy was talking about as well. Identification is only one of the aspects there, but I'm bringing it out very centrally here. What is the idea? The idea is that location is a very strong proxy for identity. If I know where a person is during the night and during the day and during the evening, um, I have a pretty good idea who that would be. And there is an, a publication which is already like uh, seven years old where people say four spatial temporal points in this case of a, of a mobile phone data set so the history of my personal phone are enough to uniquely identify 20 uh, 95 percent of individuals in the larger sample so this is pretty striking it may not 100 percent be true and generalizable but still importantly what we need to think about is that research outputs are oftentimes only surrogates so if we think we bring out a new i don't know air quality map uh, yes, it's good to use hotspot maps and spatial obfuscation, but then still um, air quality is a surrogate, for example, for cardiological um, and cardiovascular diseases, for respirational diseases, for lung diseases. So being able to zoom into a specific area maybe uh, may allow us to, to draw very concrete conclusions, uh, especially because coupling different data sources nowadays is really simple if we have, let's say, um, uh, demographic data and um, air quality, different kinds of, uh, I don't know, credit card transactions and so on. So this is something that, that should make us worry a little. For the methods I'm going, uh, I'm, I'm just skipping them for now. I'm just saying with the dots down there, there are many, many different kinds of methods like that very clearly try to address specific problems, including anonymization, including pseudonymization, uh, including obfuscation, as Shangi mentioned as well, and so on, geographical masking. Now, um, what we did is to set up a set of uh, geo privacy by design guidelines, and they're yeah pretty broad. Obviously, I think all in all, it's like forty eight or so um, points. Um, not too easy to follow ourselves as well. So if we do this, we would do nothing else uh, every day. But these are the basic categories that we that we propose. So first of all, is IT security and safety. I guess that's a given one that your IT system needs to be secure. Second one is data storage processing and analysis. So um, assigning a privacy manager, um, then of course, anonymization and, and, um, and pseudonymization, then uh, using privacy preserving methods and parameters. So for example, uh, Jean-Guy showed a heat map before. I don't know whether it was made by KDE or whatever, some kind of either density-based or attribute clustering. Um, the idea is how do you set the parameters to let's say um, prevent identification of people and to prevent clear conclusions back onto individuals. And then of course disclosure is one of the major effects as well that we need to tackle. So talking about aggregated visualizations, uh, reduced resolutions in our, in our maps, not sharing multiple versions of data sets, um, defining clear usage rules, what people can do and what people cannot do with data. Okay, so this was oops, a very brief, um, let's say, run through um, of why I think geo privacy and location privacy matter. And I'm very much looking forward to discuss all the methods that I mentioned and potential um, issues, implications, and ways of preserving privacy in the discussion. And I'm happy to take any questions, of course. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Bernd Resch. Uh, this is uh, the topic of location more urgent than ever with all the tracking possibilities uh, we have around. Next, uh, shall we give the table to uh, Jan Rebois? Yes. Hello, good afternoon. So I will uh, present a bit the uh, ICRC cases. So it's so simple. So now those days really to, to build some uh, web mapping application. And the idea is uh, more uh, lesson learned, I will say. And I will explain and uh, try to see how and what we, we try to do at the ICRC. So at the ICRC, we are mainly following, I would say, uh, two guidelines and standards uh, so that are consigned into two books. So the first one is Professional Standard for Protection Work, and the other is a Handbook on the Data Protection and Humanitarian Action. And basically, it is a kind of a, a, a Bible. So I really encourage you to, to, to have a look. I will share a bit uh, later the, uh, the, the link. So the principle for us is really to minimize the risk and to avoid the, the harm of the data. So it starts with a, a first data governance. And based on that, we will grant access. We will uh, try to work by the data by design, about the data storage, of course, the security, the integration and the data interoperability, the georeferential and data, metadata, quality and data, and of course, the GS architecture. So, do not harm you with your data. So it shows that when you register to the 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 the, the ICRC, to the UNG, uh, you have probably seen the, the data disclaimer, and it, it's quite long. So we 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 are really taking care of all of the, the humanitarian, and, and this is something that at the ICRC with the GS team we are uh, uh, really conscious on that. It shows that nowadays it's so simple to, to build a, a web app, web maps, uh, from the data collection up to the data visualization, but it's really difficult to control. So I will share a bit of this sample. So it's really easy to use and to create some dashboard. The link from mobile data collection tools like to survey one, two, three is so easy. Even if you try to, to guarantee some uh, group management access matrix, it's always difficult to uh, keep the control of the data. So for us, we have to put in place a, a strong governance and a strong follow-up of the GS team. So at the ICRC, we are working with more or less 40 GS or mapping technicians. And we have to constantly to monitor uh, what they are doing and what they are putting into the cloud, because it shows that uh, ArcGIS Online remains a cloud, a, a cloud uh, a solution. And in one of the, 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 the guidebook is do not store personal data into the cloud. So. So for, for a public use, from a survey to the data publication, for us, we consider that the anonymization is almost impossible. So you might cluster the data, you might aggregate the data, but from the raw data and the REST service endpoint, you could always access to the, to the whole data set. So we were, all GS officers, we're thinking that Basically, why it's it's good. We try to really uh, protect by clusterizing the data and really to 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 voilà, to to group the data. But at the end of the day, bah, voilà, it's uh, unfortunately we have to cancel all the work because voilà, public data and individual case were stored into the the, the ArcGIS Online. So we have to find another solution. So we were thinking, of course, to downgrade the location, but it's true that when it comes to the public usage and overview, the downgrade the location for the sensitive data might be useful, but it's not really possible, especially for when you would like to keep a, a, a workflow. Otherwise, you will have to put some process as it was done by, uh, by MSF of getting the data, putting the data, transforming the data, and then amazing the data, putting it somewhere, and of course, not in the cloud. So. It's, it's for us, it's really, again, trying to, to with the demand and the, the needs, we have to, uh, to, to, to jungle with this. But uh, for us, it's really, even if we, we try to aggregate with, uh, let's say, uh, administrative le level or to, to in, your, in your survey, at the end of the day, the, uh, uh, the coordinates collected from your smartphone uh, 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 provide much, uh, much more of the information on the, uh, on the location. So here it's a sample that 
what we see uh, from our GS team. Again, it's uh, uh, we are supporting the, the authorities of the of the uh, of the uh, Jubas water uh, water authorities, and we really see. But voilà, we we want to help them. They really requested about the names, blah blah blah, family, age, gender, and again we have to do the police to say, okay, let's stop it. Uh, uh, find another way to uh, to collect the data and to analyze the data. And of course, they, they are hating us because we have to put some process workflow and uh, uh, in between, and, of, and it slow down a bit the, the, the operation. So for us at ICRC, the only way is really an internalization of the GIS architecture. It could, it could be, for instance, ArcGIS portal. We have as well to minimize the, the, the leak from the less train and sensitize to the geodata team. So to ensure that we have a, a good uh, data literacy program, that we ensure that they, they, they understand the risk when they are manipulating uh, the data. And it's as well a, a lot of lobbying with the manager because some of the manager, even in the health sector, say, okay, I would like to have a quick and fast setup. Please do it. And in fact, blah, blah, between the the request from the manager, the, the, the local technician, and so on. It's, it's always difficult to say, okay, let's let's do it something uh, uh, nice for them. But at the end of the day, it's putting at risk our uh, uh, beneficiaries. Uh, so what we are trying to do is as well to generate uh, the terms of use for uh, uh, the application. So this is a, a process that we are doing with our data protection team. Another sample I would like to talk about, it's uh, we are working now at an application that is called uh, RedSafe to provide support to uh, beneficiaries. It could be a uh, migrant and those data could be uh, into, uh, uh, could be viewable from a smartphone. And the idea is to offer an access to the services. So it could be, uh, uh, of course, the ICRC uh, present, it could be uh, NGOs, it could be uh, lawyers, it could be blah, blah, blah. So we, 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 we really would like to provide this information to, 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 to for instance, the mig migrants. But the first uh, problem that we had, it's in fact, all of those uh, mapping uh, data providers, typically uh, 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 Mapbox or Google, are keeping tracks and logs of the, the, the request of the tiles. So we could imagine that it's possible to identify that X downloaded from this IP and probable uh, and, and possible an area of interest. So at the, at the end of the day, he might cross the, the, this area of inter interest. And sorry, at, at the end of the day, it's possible to identify the person. So what we have to do, it's at, at the end of the day, it's uh, 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 in order to avoid uh, uh, the recognition possible recognition of who was uh, uh, taking the data, it, we have to adapt the GS architecture. And what we are trying to do is, uh, it's true that initially we were thinking to work with the data and to store the data, everything online, typically in Argis online, but at the end of the day, we went back uh, following the DPU uh, recommendation and we have to uh, internalize everything. So what we have to do is we have to set up uh, 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 a, a tile-based server, so we will we, we'll take uh, uh, OSM dev uh, regularly. This will be hosted on the ICRC server in order to avoid the tracking of the, the, the origin of the request. So in order to protect and to, to ensure the, this level of, uh, of uh, voilà, granularity, I will say, but we, we have to adapt and to modify the uh, GIS architecture. And of course, it's applied uh, uh, some modification of the workflow and of course, a bit higher cost. I'm over for now. I will give the floor to uh, Yves. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jan Rebois, very thought provoking. And uh, please, uh, Yvonne Orant, uh, go ahead. Good uh, evening now, because it's getting dark in Geneva. Um, maybe not for you all. So um, yes, I before I start uh, with my presentation, I wanted to, uh, well, basically everything that uh, people uh, talked about, uh, it's it's very similar. I mean, I'm, I'm putting Wendy, for example, for all the collection of the data that we do. And in Unitia, we have the same thing. We are collecting lots of data. We're collecting, of course, the Unitia presence, the location of refugee camps, but we're doing also camp mapping um, with part of our uh, staff that are doing also the site planning. So they are doing lots of 
uh, new plans for camps and we are mapping the 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 the, the real uh, camp when it's been built so we are collecting lots of these and and i'm going to show you show you some examples but before that i wanted to reflect on on what happened in the past few years um in the the, the data collection and uh, the dissemination of the data if you look at it uh we went in the past few years or maybe in the past 10 years uh through an, a strange era which basically where we all said data is power and it's true i mean the more data you collect and and the more powerful you are i mean if you think about facebook data it led to the election of a president that we all know and um uh it, it's indeed very powerful now if you analyze this and you think a little bit more the new tools available uh, through Kobo and and uh, Jan mentioned it and uh, the other panelists mentioned it. There were different marathons, so group of people all over the world to analyze an imagery and to collect and store uh, geographical data. Uh, new tools such as RGS Collector or Server123 that we saw in various presentations. This evolution of the of, of the tools available made the data collection actually extremely used extremely user friendly extremely quick and also with a limited level of expertise to, to to use them so that has improved a lot the collection and now we're able with a few tools to collect enormous amount of data really quickly if i give you an example the camp mapping we do in unhcr we need two experts a good imagery, some pre-processing data, and then we go to the field in one week with 10 people that we usually hire with uh, through the refugees, and we can map up camp of 20,000 people. The evolution and availability of imagery. I mean, the very high resolution. I remember a time where you need a military access to, to get imagery, and now it's no longer the case, of course. It's all commercial. And you've got the evolution, of course, of the drone imagery, and I'm sure you all have used a drone. Uh, and with the drone data, you can uh, get extremely detailed information about a camp, uh, elevation models, and you don't care if it's a cloudy area, because let's talk about Bangladesh, where we have a, a camp of uh, almost a, a million people. Uh, the, the, this camp before, to get an image in Bangladesh, a uh, satellite image was difficult. Now it's no longer the case. Um, and I want to mention also the evolution of communication, because with these tools, these new tools and RGS collector working on mobile devices, nobody bet like 20 years ago on the 3G, 4G network. Of course, in industrialized countries, the 3G, 4G, 5G now is, is of course, uh, you, you, you know the... the capacities of those, net, of those networks and what you can do with them. And especially if you want to collect data and transfer data to a server, it's extremely quick. But nobody bets on the evolution of communications in African countries. But the truth is now, you've got a very decent 3G network almost everywhere in Africa. And that's a great improvement in the way we collect data. And to add to this, in this little history, there's been, and I think you, you the other panelists would agree, that in the last few years, there's been an emphasis on data visualization. Uh, in UNHCR, we hired a specialist, which is coming from the design world. And, and now everybody is doing dashboards. And you need to master the colors, how many colors are you going to use, and, and the different, how to do properly a graph. And that's data visualization. And that has improved a lot. And I know in UNHCR, the way we do maps has improved a lot because of the venue of this person. Now let's see an example of, of what we are doing in UNHCR. This is camp mapping and this is camp 22 in Bangladesh. You can see on the right side that we've got this, the drone imagery and from that we derived all these building uh, footprints. Extremely useful that it extends on the, on the left side and you can see all these building footprints. In addition to that, you can collect all uh, the sports centers, the shops in the camps, the playgrounds, the latrines, the water points and the shelters. As you can see, you've got little uh, dots in different colors. And these are the shelters within buildings. And you can see that in some buildings, there are more than one shelter. 
And as you probably know, the UNHCR for the refugees and for the asylum seekers, uh, even IDPs and returnees, we, we do have in most of our camps now a registration system, a very detailed in, uh, information system that is actually registering individual data for each families and individuals within these families with photos, with the, where they live, where they are from, and it's, it's very detailed data. And if you look at that map and you see the identifier of the shelter and in the registration uh, system, we know the shelter, the shelter identifier, then we can link the data. And then it's an extremely powerful tool to be able to see which are the vulnerable people located in the camp and at which distance they are for, from uh, different services. So the analytical, possibility is, is really enormous. Even experts can analyze the proximity of what points if, uh, and, and with the elevation models you can get from drone data, you can also uh, do some flood analysis in a camp. That's what we did in Kutupalong, identifying the buildings that could be at risk. And therefore very early in, uh, in time, you can start moving the people within the camp before the, the, the rainy season comes. So this is how we use uh, very detailed geographic information now in UNHCR. When I started, we were barely collecting the position of a camp in the world, and it was like approximate location. But now we, we are down to this. If you look at this picture, and that's just to, to show the, the, the level of details you can get, uh, this is a drone imagery, and you can derive with pre-production, pre even without going to the camp, we can derive lots of shelter footprints and Going to a camp in a week time, you get the, the camp map. So that's that's a very, very important uh, evolution for what UNHCR is doing. And it's very uh, helpful for the people. Now I wanted, to, and that's quite funny because my last slide, almost the last one, is a map we did. And actually, Yann Rebois did this map in 2006 in Cairo. And this map is showing actually, and it's still valid because now that's what we did in 2006, but you can see all the blocks within the uh, Cairo city. And we mapped basically the refugees from uh, by, by nationality, basically. The, so the different colors you're seeing and now are, are the different refugees by nationality. And it's very useful to, to if you add to this map the services available for the refugees in that city, knowing that most of the refugees now have mobile phones, you can have web maps displaying that information to be able to display on a very simple map how far they are from different services such as the tribunals or the court of law or the uh, first aid services or hospitals that, that could receive refugees uh, without nationality cards, for example. So this is, you can clearly see it's very useful, but what is the danger of this? If you take them an example, in, and I, I'll be trivial here, but if you look at a map of Moscow with the same information, the location of the apartments that is easily collected by taking the address or just a, a RGS collector, imagine that we're mapping the nationality of the refugees in Moscow. You'll probably see in that map, USA as a nationality but you'll probably get one red dot for this location. And I think if you, if you think about one refugee from USA in Moscow, it gives only one name. I didn't disclose this information, but I'm sure you, can, you, you know who I'm talking about. If you don't, uh, then uh, you, we will, um, you can ask the question in the q and I will answer that. Uh, so getting information and apparently, anonymous information is not necessarily uh, completely uh, com completely uh, anonymous. Um, last thing, I took this figure from a source OCHA in 2005, and if you look at this, it's the information management management chain. When we did that, you see the it's collection, processing information, analyzing, and dissemination. We talked about two things here, the collection and processing. The tools are structuring the data like Kobo, avoiding mistakes. So the, the, the data is very well structured now, easy to use. So the processing is less. The collection has improved a lot. We talked about the, all the dashboards you're doing and all the, this data visualization now, the trend. 
uh, it's the dissemination uh, of uh, information. And we did great uh, improvement in that domain as well. And you probably see where I'm getting at, because what is this part now? And that's the problem now, I think, in most agencies. At least in UNHCR, we are starting to identify that if you want an analogy, I believe collection and analysis are two planes flying together. And uh, why in the Air Force we know that two planes have to fly together is because they protect themselves. And it's a bit the same thing. Collection and analysis have to fly side by side. If one is distanced by the other one, then you put yourself at risk. And that's basically, I think, what, a bit what is happening now, which we collect tremendous amount of data. We are asking GIS officers to actually make sense of the data, which is the analysis part. But may, sometimes people are, all the, our experts, when the collection method has proved to be very, uh, very useful, then they tend to do, oh, you've been doing this for camp. That's great. Now do this for all the camps. And they collect, collect, collect. But if we can't analyze, and I will quote Ben Parker now, which uh, did a, uh, the first uh, introduction to this GONG uh, yesterday, with, the, with this collection of great data comes enormous amount of responsibilities. And the more you collect, the more responsibilities you have. And I think those responsibilities lies in the analysis part. And this analysis has to be done by experts. And very often, they are asking the global data service, for example, in UNHCR, to analyze data, and sometimes not analyze only GIS data, but analyze uh, the health data, which I think we shouldn't be doing because we that should be the expertise of a, a medical doctor for, for that matter. So, we have to be careful of this, and I think that's where uh, there's some improvement to be done because the responsibility that we need to have with the level of and the amount of data we're collecting right now is 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 enormous. And that will be all for me for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne. And uh, thank you for all the panelists who have been talking. And I hope uh, some uh, questions uh, have uh, come to your mind uh, during this conversation. And uh, still, uh, please, everyone, if there is any questions, feel free, uh, please uh, share with us. And um, we will try to integrate those into the discussion topics. So to start with, I was thinking that as um, data persons, uh, and uh, many of us are data dealing with data in the sense that we are producing the end products, uh, say dashboards and statics maps with the given data. Should we actually uh, raise uh, this data protection concern as the first uh, issue when uh, say your operations manager says, uh, can you create a map with uh, cash transfer assistance uh, beneficiaries? Uh, so uh, instead of assuming that everything is fine on the data protection side, we should actually treat this as something equally important as, uh, for example, the design of the dashboard and uh, really the first thing to ask uh, that um, first thing we should ask is actually can we guarantee the that uh, the data is being protected and uh, that uh, we can guarantee this do no harm principle with the end product and this is for all the panelists i guess maybe i'll just go first then <laughs> So yeah, I think those are really important things we do have to consider and definitely discuss. And I mean, in Mind Action, what we try to do is have kind of what we call stakeholder workshops, where we sit with all the stakeholders who need a variety of different information products from the National Authority and the Information Management Team. And we ask those key questions, what kinds of information do you need to do what you need to do? or in terms of for donors, what information do you need to know in order to ensure 
that you know your reporting is being your, your reporting requirements are being fulfilled. And I think once we have those key questions, then it comes down to discussing with a variety of actors within within the operations, within national authority, who have ownership of the data, collect the data to determine on what level, what, what are the minimum requirements needed to provide answers to those questions. And I think we really should focus on those minimum requirements. There is a quite of a, a big amount of enthusiasm I, enthusiasm I've seen where people want to show all their data, show just have this very informatic dashboard that has a lot of really cool, you know, blips and blops and gadgets and statistics and stuff like that. And, you know, at times there's not as much attention or care to the details that they're providing access to that they don't realize. So someone clicks on a certain data point in the interactive map, they get a pop-up. And if they haven't gone through the whole constraints that are involved in data sensitivity, they may be showing the entire database and showing things they never intended to. But again, I think it comes down to that communication line, discussing with stakeholders what their needs are. And then in turn, once you have those answers, having that really in-depth discussion with those who are responsible for that data to decide what can be shown minimally and stick to the minimum requirements. And of course, with the understanding that these information products are like living documents in a way. They can grow and evolve as, as needs arise. So if a dashboard goes out and the user says, okay, that hits the five things I was asking for, but actually I realized I need to see a little bit of a tweak on this and a little bit more of this, then you can always fix those. So I would say err on the side of caution, show the minimum first and work with the end user from there, but most particularly work with those responsible with the data to ensure that privacy is met. Can I quickly add to that? Or I don't know whether the audience has another follow up there. Um, so thanks, Wendy. I think what you sketched out is, is the case that we're all dealing with. I think when it gets more tricky is when the minimum is not enough. So you say, I have to go down to this and this um, level, uh, let's say of, I don't know, resolutions of um, data protection of uh, even leaving out data of, of spatial obfuscation. And then the information product gets worthless. And then this is where the clash is, right? Because as long as, as the information that we present in maps is enough anyway, then, then we're fine. Then we're not in trouble in the end, right? Because then it's just a matter of negotiation, finding the right level and, and uh, we're basically done. So the, this, this trade-off, let's say, between exposing um, people's privacy, identity, um, and on the other hand, providing a high quality information product I think is the, is the, is the important uh, thing to tackle. I have no clear answer to that, by the way. It's just um, a, uh, a statement right now. Um, because let's say there are, there are many um, methods available on what we can do and what we should do and what we're doing. That's, that's the good news. So um, let's say talking about aggregation and talking about dynamic aggregation as jean Guy showed as well. Um, and then talking about obfuscation and so on and so on. But then again, if I take a look at one of Jan's maps, which is the hotspot map, I don't know, remember what it, what it was, but there was, uh, I don't know again, what it was done through KDE, it looks like. Um, then what you see is like one very clear circle, which spans exactly across one location that's visible already. And the spatial granularity is as far down as to one single block or house, right? And then the question is, okay, what do I do? Do I leave it out, which again, obviously compromises information quality, or do I build larger circles for my, for my let's say kernel or whatever I'm gonna use? Um, or um, is the information product then not usable anymore at all? So I'm not sure how, how to tackle this, but this is I think where, where the tension then comes from. Thank you very much for your answers, uh, Wendy and uh, Bernd. Any thoughts on this from anyone, any of the, the panelists? If there's anyone from the audience who would like to share the thoughts, uh, um, please uh, you use the Q&A. Um, for the further questions, um, 
another thing that I think is uh, highly re relevant uh, for many of us is this uh, diplomacy for negotiating the trade-offs. Like, um, have have you experienced this this, uh, this uh, difficulties when uh, the requesting party is proposing something like show all cases on COVID uh, as as uh, much detail as possible and then negotiating this uh, trade-off. Is there any hints or tips uh, to, on this diplomacy and um, how, to, how to convince the other party on this uh, data protection side? I mean, there, I think, is, is a dual, um, let's say, attribution to this. So we first, in the beginning, talked about our moral obliga uh, obligations from an ethical viewpoint, right? What are we allowed to do and what do we allow ourselves to do and what's our code of conduct? The other thing is what's legally actually sustainable and what may be done in terms of sharing data. So as you were referring to the epidemiological use case, I think we're not much in trouble with, um, with showing aggregated data in terms of uh, heat maps as a result from the hotspot analysis. I think there we're safe because when I show a map of, let's say, uh, the US that I, that I showed before, this is based on uh, probably 10 million observations or so. So this, this is not the trouble. The idea is uh, comes into place then when we are requested to share individual data sets. So as I showed, for example, in the beginning, um, what people report about the refugee situation, what people report about the emergence of uh, new and perhaps um, unseen uh, refugee settlements, uh, when it comes to, to disaster management and so on, when, when people report on damages and so on, then uh, it's, it's really hard to, to uh, let's say, take a decision. Because first of all, I think we all are in the same boat in the sense that we try to do things for the good. So I think we're not driven by, I don't know, uh, economic matters as, as social media companies would, for example, be. Um, but then on the other hand, uh, what, do we, what do we negotiate in terms of a license agreement? Um, what can be done with, with the data? So for example, when we put the single data sets out there to organizations like the Red Cross, MSF and so on, what we usually do is um, that we have an iterative feedback loop um, when they produce their own information products. Um, so what's happening right now basically is for the refugee situation in Southeast Europe, um, but also for the uh, COVID-19 situation, um, the German Red Cross produces their own, um, let's say, piece of information for their emergency and disaster management board. Okay, so now what do they put in there? Sometimes, yes, they put individual pictures in there and then, then that's pretty much critical. Um, but this is for us, like let's say, as an as an uh, as a providing party to decide. Having said that, for Twitter, it's not that hard to decide, mostly because the data are public. But that's mostly not a good excuse either. Thank you. I, yeah. Yes, please. I may just um, add a little bit on what has been said before about the um, the diplomacy basically when we interact with users asking for this kind of features because we are all at the end support department supporting operations um, I mean there's a growing understanding in the missions as well um, of the fact that uh, if actions are taken that are not in compliance with good data protection principles there are not only consequences far away on the organization but also very close to them especially when local authorities start to take a more firm stance on it and uh, over the last years, it has been come much and much, much more and more sorry, easier to um, to uh, to discuss these kind of limitations with them and to not uh, hit a wall when uh, we simply have to give up the project and, and stop the support. Um, thanks, Jean Guy. Um, we have some questions on the Q and A um, uh, chat. Uh, and these are more technical questions, so I suggest that we can also talk a bit about technical and methodological aspects. Uh, Jean-Guy, there is uh, two questions for you related to the grid um, aspect. How many uh, sizes of grid cell you ended up having with this manual definition? And the second question is, 
how do you decide how big the grid cell should be based on the number of people who live in that area or just eye bailing to make sure it looks good? Yeah, no problem. In a way, I think I can answer them uh, both at the same time. Uh, how many uh, grid size do we have? Uh, basically, there are two in the methodology, one for country size, which is bigger, countryside size, which is bigger, and then one for urban context or areas, which is smaller. Um, at the moment, uh, in terms of uh, how many are implemented, the one uh, that is uh, larger, which is the most protective one uh, for countries, is implemented all over the areas of the mission, for the urban ones, which are smaller and more delicate to implement, they are still under review, and especially due to the COVID year and the shift on the priorities on mission, they are not yet implemented in the GOAT. In terms of numbers of grid cells themselves, there are 800 over the uh, global areas, and if we finalize the implementation of the urban ones, uh, there will be 400 additional small ones. Now, uh, for the second question, how do we decide how big the grid cell should be? The first proposition comes from us. We base ourselves on an OSM buildings data set and calculate a maximum amount of number that should be allowed uh, of buildings per grid cell. That gives us a minimum, so we don't have one, um, basically one farm in the middle of a grid cell, which would allow easy, easy um, identification. And then uh, the second uh, level of validation is done manually, visually by the lock codes, uh, logistic coordinators of the mission who have an intimate understanding of the areas. And yes, and then yes, for this second round, it's high, um, high volume. Thanks, Thank Randy. We have another question related to methodology um, from Annabella. So she's asking, coming from a small island, how to mask privacy for maps since population are small? Because the sample size is small, should this be to the community level or should we main country level for data points? So I think we can enlarge the discussion related to a methodological um, uh, aspect. Want to take this question? Wouldn't that fit with you, Shangi? Because you, in the end, need to decide uh, what the number in your in your raster cells is. So I know that the uh, the U UK census, for example, uh, has the same way of aggregating, right? So what they do is they say uh, we don't have a regular raster grid, but they have let's say arbitrary regions, more or less polygons, um, and they want to have between what five and five and a half thousand people or so. So to be small enough to draw statistical conclusions, but to be large enough to, um, to avoid um, conclusions back on individuals, minority groups, uh, and so on and so on. So uh, Annabella, not knowing where exactly you come from, but um, it, it depends heavily on the, um, on the uh, spatial distribution of, of the data, I would say, in the sense that if you're heavily clustered, um, things don't matter so much and population tends to be heavily clustered. If you have, I don't know, uh, one farm in the outback, also spatial obfuscation, for example, doesn't help, right? So if you have very few people, then um, you, you, can, you can provide different kinds of, of privacy preserving measures uh, that, that won't lead to the goal there. Uh, case. Yeah, that's it for myself. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, maybe very quickly, um, not on that use case, but on sim as I mentioned, this is a tailor, uh, tailor make solution. And then obviously, there have been a discussion based on that experience to see if we can enlarge this solution to other missions in the MSF movement. So obviously, at the moment, it's not a one for all solution. We have seen earlier in the GONG that it's not always, by the way, the, the thing to go. Uh, but I mean, in other contexts, we have uh, analyzed in comparison to this one if it could be implemented. And for some other contexts, which was in India, um, we basically uh, raised, um, touched the point uh, with uh, the mission that um, they, I mean, the original people asking for this uh, kind of a GIS visualization did not have a precise idea in mind of what they were asking for. And through a demonstration of what it would imply in terms of data protection practices and data protection risks, the conclusion taken was simply do not go ahead. And uh, from our point of view, uh, the GIS unit of MSF 
even though we have a support role to uh, our operations, and that's true in all organizations, there is a threshold that should not be um, stepped over, which is it's a legitimate answer to say, as a technical support unit, your proposition cannot be implemented without taking too many risks. We can always propose workaround or a shift of the original request, but it's also a legitimate answer to give as a technical body. Yeah, maybe I will uh, uh, complement on other things in terms of methodology. So that's something as well that we we did as well with uh, with OpenStreetMap uh, data as well. It's uh, basically we are building artificial blocks. I would say made on the uh, main street, in fact, because it's true that uh, uh, by aggregating by grids for our colleagues, it's uh, sometimes a bit too uh, virtual, in fact, and, and and they see of course the patterns or the trends. But what we are doing, it's uh, maybe we are building because one of the challenges as well is always to have, a, I, I will say, a neighborhood or this kind of things of a, uh, administrative level where you will be able to, to aggregate maybe. So that's also something that is interested. And what we are doing, in fact, we are taking uh, maybe sometimes the, the main roads, I will say, and we will uh, define the number of uh, houses or buildings that could be uh, within those main roads and we are building artificial blocks or artificial districts and then we could aggregate the data, those data to these artificial blocks or districts and it's a bit more meaningful for the end users than a grid that is very very uh, virtual and sometimes difficult to 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 understand for our colleagues i have a question for uh, for you jan and Yvon. um looking at your presentation uh, and I think Jan, you, ACRC is one of the most advanced uh, organizations uh, and with a uh, well structured guidelines in terms of data protection. And what you put in place in terms of GIS uh, management uh, also shows that you are quite a step ahead. And uh, I would like to, um, to hear you about uh, the operationality of uh, what you put in place. Uh, do you feel that uh, you are constrained or? Is it still useful for the operation that you are supporting? Alors, is it still useful? But it's true that uh, the fact that uh, if we really follow the guides to the simple uh, chapter or, or to the sing single rules, sometimes it's almost impossible to work. So we have to do some compromise and uh, either we say no, either sometimes we will try to okay let's go back to the basic take the data and do the, the the rendering of the data with the static maps and so on but it's true that the way it's so simple to to get those information through the cloud it's 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 a no-go huh? we see that uh, uh, we, we we are not doing so that's why we are really getting back to on premises in order to ensure that um, the data will that the process will continue and that the data remain fully on, on the control of the ICRC. Thank you, Jan. And even as you mentioned that uh, years before, we did not collect that uh, many data, but now uh, it's quite uh, a lot. Uh, what's your uh, impression on the, um, for you, is it, um, um, it, it give more support to the operation uh, as we collect more data? Well, uh, actually, th this is a very good question because uh, in, the, in the data uh, information management chain, uh, you, you can see that we're collecting data and we're doing the analysis and then we disseminate the data. And if you don't have the capacity to properly analyze, analyze this data and make sense, basically, of the data, then you might want to why you want to collect it. My point of view is when you have an opportunity and that's probably what people do is when you, there is an opportunity to easy, easily collect data, then people do it. Because you are on, in the camp, uh, for example, you uh, take opportunity of that mission to collect that data and at a very detailed, because you, you're not sure what you're gonna do with it because many of the GIS data we collect, for example, they're not necessarily for the GIS officers to analyze. And this is one of the problems we have in UNHCR is to, and now we're tackling this, is to break the silos because in most cases, any data set, you need two people. If it's GIS data, you need a GIS specialist and you need another specialist, let's say a water point, then you will need a wash officer 
to properly analyze the data. But if we don't have this analysis capacity, then you have to be careful because I've seen also that when data is collected, there's lots of people and maybe uh, at a higher level that would like to show this. Oh, we have collected this. We have the data. So they want to show that we've collected the data and it ends up in many of the dashboards I've seen, which is basically data vomiting. Pardon me the expression, but it's a bit like this. Like there's too much data and there's no, there's lots of tools to, to show the raw data. And is it that useful? Is there anyone that has the capacity to analyze, like let's say the COVID-19 data. I've been asked to do maps with COVID-19 data, but there was so much data does that make sense, what I'm trying to show? I'm not a health expert. I'm not an epidemiologist. So if I don't rely to some specialist inside my organization to actually make sense of the da this data before I try to make something relevant, then, you know, it's, it's difficult. Uh, so, yeah, we have to be careful. And sometimes the amount of data I realize that we collect is not useful now, might be useful in future, but we might wonder why we have cut, we have spent so much time collecting it if we're not uh, if we're not able to analyze it. I would say. But it's so easy to collect data that people go for it. I'm afraid. Thanks, Yvon. Uh, back to the Q and A uh, channel. Uh, we have a question uh, for you, um, Dr. Bernd. Uh, I can read it. When working with Twitter data that users have voluntarily made public, do you feel like that is permission for you to be less careful when republishing that data? That is a very, very good and valid question. The short answer is no. Um, the a bit longer answer is um, that we, first of all, work with samples, subsamples of data. So um, what we get from Twitter now is a sample of 1%. Twitter says, and nobody really knows, um, that this 1% is representative okay, of population groups over space, over time, and so on. Um, and uh, the, the idea is that it, our analysis is still statistically robust, although the sample is, is rather small, comparably small. I mean, talking about, uh, about billions of data sets here. Um, and the second thing is, that um, the, the Twitter as a, as a data source is public, right? This, that's one of the better um, uh, characteristics there. So in contrast to WhatsApp, Facebook, and so on, which are basically private communication channels, uh, what you do on Twitter is to send a microblog message. So you basically post it to the world and everybody who wants to listen can listen, right? So that's a bit of a different concept there, how you share your personal data. Now, of course, um, this is not a general allowance. And there was a verdict, let's say, nine or eight months ago um, that um, said that um, the European Asylum Support Office, EASO, uh, was not allowed to perform social media monitoring. So basically, continuously listening to the Twitter feed. What we have to consider, I think, uh, first and foremost, so the, the, by the way, the, um, the um, justification for that ruling was that um, as by the GDPR, as defined by the GDPR, um, ESO did not have a lawful basis for processing. And that's always, of course, the major given aspect that we need to consider. Um, now we as a university, as an academic body, have a specific standing there. So we do usually not provide um, continuous productive services um, and like that from a research and, and academic scientific viewpoint uh, we usually have uh, a, a let's say special standing when it comes to these kinds of, um, of protection rules but again the short answer no this is not the general allowance thanks uh, Wendy, there is a question for you, uh, still from uh, Luca. Uh, do you find that community organizations often ask for data? They are not allowed to have when trying to find out exactly where mine are in their community. If so, how do you respond? Uh, so Luca is working on a website for disseminating community level epidemiological data and uh, they suppress a great deal of data for privacy reasons. This often be 
makes community member unhappy as they feel we are holding the data. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Unfortunately, I have a slightly complicating answer. Um, uh, the Geneva Center itself does not host or house any of the mine action data. All the mine action data for each country is housed and owned by the national authority themselves. We at the center provide guidance and capacity building uh, to all these countries, of course, and um, operations. However, we do, of course, get questions from universities, um, students who have projects, or even uh, NGOs who wish to provide some kind of uh, project or assistance in mine action, requesting us if we can give them access to uh, national data for various countries. Um, what we usually do to help facilitate those requests is to um, get a, better, a very clear understanding of what the project is, what the needs are, uh, identify what kinds of data they actually need. Typically, they don't need the whole database and they won't need to know everything that's associated with that polygon representing that contaminated area. Um, and then we forward that request to the National Authority and, of course, put the National Authority in contact with them. And then in the end, it's up to the National Authority to decide if they share the data or not and in what capacity and to what extent. Um, but in terms of, you know, for example, on the epidemiology example, um, you know, sharing, you know, people, of course, in communities, you know, want to know where the hazards are. And especially in cases where you have grassroots uh, data collection where community members are providing data, um, that becomes the ethical issue and the question of how you're going to then share that community-driven database with the very community that helped you build and develop it. I think having clear communication and understanding with those people in concern, those people who are providing data, as well as the community effects that you know, certain aspects of the data can be shared but also kind of making it very clear on what types of aspects of the data cannot be shared for security reasons, but make sure you have that dialogue with them. What I find is having that dialogue and that open communication and keeping them part of the process in some way will alleviate that stress. And yes, there will always be people who are concerned that you're data hoarding, but find some means in which you can provide them something, whether it's a visualization or something like that. Um, again, one example I have in my action is with Croatia. Um, they've done a fantastic job in creating, working with, a, I think, an de app developer to create an application that allows people to actually know where the polygons representing contaminated areas are. So if you're walking down a road and your phone will start to vibrate, if you're reaching a certain one kilometer radius of a hazardous area, you can actually scroll through the map and actually locate where that polygon is exactly. So in some cases, yes, you can have, the user can have access to that. Of course, if they click on the polygon, they're not gonna get the level of detail, which is what type of contamination or uh, which operators doing the clearance or when it's, when it's slated for clearance, you won't get that kind of information. But you know, they found a way of helping the community to be aware of contamination in the area. And I would say in each country, it's, it's different in how they handle that situation. Uh, in some cases, some countries are worried about tourism, uh, discouraging tourists. They would rather just mark off no-go areas instead of showing exactly where and to what density contamination may be. But again, I would say for that community that is concerned and ep ep epidemiological data, have that closed dialogue with them, continue communication, be open to their questions, but also be very, very clear with them on why and what cannot be shared with them. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy. This, uh, yeah, this is uh, this question on data hoarding. That's uh, really, I, I think, something we we all come across at, at some uh, some point, and that's why the related diplomacy it's uh, it's uh, highly important for hi highly important uh, to <laughs> to manage that uh, achieving what is uh, what is uh, requested and uh, not uh, making compromises with the data privacy because of of trying to do, achieve something more i think all the questions we have we had have been now answered uh, yeah so mm -hmm. um 
and we are now reaching our time limit. Uh, so is there anything, Sylvie, anything from your side to add or? I said no, thanks, thanks uh, very much for, um, for the panelists. <laughs> Thank, thank you also from my side, and um, I, I, this, it's, it's been a great, interesting discussion. I, lots of takeaways for our future assignments, and uh, hopefully everyone around has also found this important. And um, I hope to keep in touch with anyone regarding this, uh, this bigger um, topic around, the, around this, um, the topic of this roundtable and data protection. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Good continuation. Nice continuation. Bye bye. Thank you very much. And bye bye. Bye. bye.